If you can uh, find your way back to your seats. So good, at everybody, to be here today. Um, we have a special guest who's going to come and greet us and share some wonderful information with us. About once a year, um, the Gideons come and share their message, and they have a table set up out in front of the ladies' uh, restroom. Be sure to go by there, and at the end of the service, we're going to have a place where you can uh, give to their ministry uh, if you so desire. And just, I don't know about you, but I don't know how many times I've been in a hotel room or different places and reached over there and grabbed the Gideon's Bible and thank God for them. And uh, thank the, uh, for their ministry as well. So we're glad to welcome John Duguid to come and share with us this morning. Let's give him a warm welcome. Leah is a 23-year-old Christian girl working as a certified nurse assistant in a North Dallas hospital. One day after work, she decided to stop at the grocery store. Now you're wondering, what's this got to do with Gideon's, right? Well, we'll get there. As she walked through the parking lot to go back to her car, a young man attacked her from behind. As he dragged her across the parking lot towards a nearby hotel, Leah tried to think of scripture, anything to keep her mind focused on the Lord's provision and promise of protection. I knew fear was from the devil, she said. I tried to think rationally what to do. Then it came to me, the Gideons, regularly placed Bibles in the hotel rooms. So she hoped that there was one there. Miraculously, when they drag her into the hotel room, on the nightstand there was one. And the man that was holding her kind of let loose of her for a minute, and she dashed over and grabbed that Bible, and she opened it to the middle of it. And there she read Psalms 59 and started reading out loud. Deliver me from my enemies, O oh my God. Protect me from them that rise up against me. Deliver me from this situation. And as she read, she read louder and louder and louder. And she could hear the men behind her going, Get that book away from her! They even murmured about what to do about it. And they kept arguing back and forth. She could hear them in the background. But she kept reading and she kept reading. And then... It was quiet, and she looked, and the room was empty. She called the police, and she hung on to that Bible. She was thanking God for the fact that we had been there and put the Bible there, but it was God, she said, that saved her. When the police got there, they checked. In the bathroom of the motel room was duct tape, a plastic bag, and a shovel. She knew that she had been totally protected by God's protection because of the word of God in that room. The Gideon's International is Association of Born Again Christian laymen and professional men organized in 1899. Older than dirt, right? Well, not quite. In that time that we have been organized, we have delivered over 
2 billion scriptures around the world in 200 countries, including the United States. In Isaiah 55, 11, it says, So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it will accomplish the purpose I sent it. What was God's word there in that hotel room that morning or that evening to protect this young lady? I'm here today to tell a little bit about the story of the Gideons. Where we're in, where we are, where we're going, and what we're doing. You see, you have a Bible rack out there with a Gideon card in it. You send the cards. They don't cost you anything. But inside is a place where you can make a donation to the work, and you will get a receipt for your donation. Many times I've used a Gideon card to express my hopefulness, helpfulness to a friend. This one friend, couple of ours, they were celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary, and they said no gifts. Well, we sent them a card. My wife and I sent them a card. And the note that came back was, that really meant more to us than anything that anyone could do. The Gideon National also have created programs. Years and years ago, we could go into the schools. Now we can't. We have the Lifebook program. What is the Lifebook? Well, this gray one is the book of Mark. It's fairly new. The other white one is the book of John. It's got notes in it and that type of thing. Your church can order these for your youth. Your youth can study them. Uh-oh. And take them into the school with them. ACLU doesn't fight that because it's kid on kid. So you can do that. We've created a program where people say, I want to pray for you. How do I do that? Well, we have the Friends program. And there's some brochures out there on the table that give an indication of what's involved in being a friend. It doesn't cost anything. You can be a prayer friend. Or you can be a supporting friend. And now we have a Bible app card. You say, well, so what? 1,200 languages on this little card. Oh, it's a smart app, so you've got to have a smartphone. And I'll be honest with you, I just migrated to a smartphone from my flip phone about February this year, so I'm still learning. But the thing that's nice about this card is I know of a church that has a study of Greek going on. How to understand Greek. And 75% of the Greek is the same. Pretty simple, right? Well, they're using the Bible app so that all the people didn't have to go find Greek Bibles for this class. Or the Armadillo School, Christian School, down in the south part of the metropolitan area, all the kids have to take a Latin. Pastor, you got a Latin Bible? No. Oh, oh, there's a Latin app on this thing, a Latin Vulgate. And the kids use it in their classroom. You see, we open doors because people, you, say, how can we take this word further? So today, I would simply ask that you pray for our ministry. Pray that we will accomplish God's will for us. Secondly, as Pastor Dickens mentioned, there's an opportunity for a free will offering at the end of the service. Third, I would ask that you specially include a prayer because the Gideons in the metropolitan area, all of this, clear down to Castle Rock and all the way up to Boulder, are attempting to place 125,000 copies of scripture in the next month. We're starting with Boulder, 
and then going south, and we will be placing new Bibles in all the hotels, motels in the area, and handing out scripture to kids in schools all over the area. It is anticipated that we will hand out 9,000 testaments in Boulder. Pray for those scriptures. Pray for those students that receive those scriptures, and pray that the work will accomplish what God would have it to do. Thank you, Pastor Dickens. Thank you, congregation, for your time and allowing me to share this morning. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, they told me earlier, too, if you were wondering, this, uh, they're replacing all the Bibles in the hotel rooms with new ones, but they're still going to reuse the old ones. They're going to have them rebound, and those will go into the prison system. So they're very efficient as well as very diligent in their ministry as well. If you'd like to turn in your scriptures and your Bible, turn to Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. We've been doing this series entitled Experiencing God and the Seven Realities of Experiencing God. And we're at reality number three, and that is invitation. And this is where God invites you to be a part of his work. And we're looking at examples of this from the life of Moses. And so in Exodus chapter 3, verse 7, we have one of the most famous events that happen in the life of Moses. And this is when he has gone to the burning bush. In verse 7, it says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Now therefore, behold, the cry, or I just read that, come now therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people the children of Israel, out of Egypt. God invites you to join his work. And what's important about this is that this is a very important shift for us. And what it is, it is the shift from being self-centered to God-centered. We're born self-centered. A little child is the most self-centered individual in the world. They grow up, when they're hungry, they cry. If they need their diaper changed, they cry. If they want to play, they cry. Because all they're interested in is what they want. And so our human nature is that we are self-centered individuals. We used to go through a process called growing up. And growing up, you learn to become less self-centered by realizing that you are not the center of the universe. And the problem is a lot of people don't do that anymore. They still think that everything 
that the whole world should revolve around them and what they want. And so it's something that all of us have to combat. We have to battle that inside of us. And a major step in our walk with God then is to learn that what we want is not as important as what God wants. And so that's why this is a very powerful reality. It is the shift from being self-centered to God-centered. Not about me, but about God. Now, in order to do that, we have to sacrifice our own goals. At this point in Moses' life, from what we read about him, he didn't have a whole lot of goals. He's a shepherd watching his father-in-law's sheep. His life began very differently. He had grown up in the palace of Pharaoh. He had to leave the land of Egypt. And now he is on the backside of the desert and probably thinks my life is set and this is the way my life is going to be. And God speaks to him and says, no, i got a different life for you. Well, whether our goals are small or great, we have to sacrifice our own goals in order to participate with God. Now, what we're doing then is we choose God's work. The invitation is given, but then it is up to us to make that choice. I will sacrifice what I want to achieve what God wants. And that is a huge step in your life. It is a huge step in spiritual maturity, to come to that realization that it's not what I want, but it's what God wants. Now, while we're here, let me just say one of the biggest problems that we have is that we often confuse what I want with what God wants. We think, I want this. It would be so good for me, and surely God loves me enough that He'll agree with me. If you notice here, God doesn't address Moses and say, Moses, what's your plan for your life? Tell me your plan. I would just love to bless you and your plan. No, it's not the way it works. God says, I've got a problem. Moses, I want you to help. You see, God chooses us, but then we choose God's work. And when we make that choice, then we're identifying with him, and we are deciding, okay, Lord, I'll lay down my wants. I'll lay down my desires. I'll lay down my goals, and I accept what you have. Now, let's look at Moses for a moment. Moses is sent by God. He's sent by God. When we see the pattern throughout Scripture, we'll see this over and over again. Even when you look at the apostles, the very word apostle means one who is sent. They didn't choose where they would want to go. A great example of that is the apostle Paul, arguably the greatest apostle that ever lived. God did not give him his desire. Paul, in writing the book of Romans, tells us what his desire was. 
He said, my heart's desire above anything is that Israel might be saved. If Paul had had a choice, his choice would have been this. I would be the apostle to the nation of Israel. That was his choice. He tried it. He wasn't any good. It wasn't like when Peter or James or John or any of the others preached to the Israelites. When Peter preached to the Israelites in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people are saved. When Paul preaches to the Israelites, they have riots. The soldiers are called out. People get arrested. There are, you know, Peter's statistics were how many people got saved today. Paul's statistic was how many people got arrested today. So he wants something, but God doesn't send him there. And you see, a lot of times what we want is not where God sends us. We may think, oh, I'd be good at this. But that's where we trust God, that he might know better. And so, he is sent by God. Now, Moses has a job, and that is bring the Israelites out of the land. Bring them out of the land. That's his job. Now, Moses will go on and he'll say, I'm not qualified for this. I don't think I'm going to do it very well. And God says, you're the man. You're the one I've chosen. This is your task. You see, God doesn't choose us on the basis of whether we think we're qualified or not. God chooses us because it's his desire and his will. The task, then, is chosen by God. And this task that God gives to Moses is take my we're having problems here do I need to switch over guys pardon us for a moment while we address the technical delay here I see help coming breathe easy for a moment Thank you. Now, one thing I've never had a desire to do is to be a sound man. They've asked me, Pastor, do you want us to show you? And I say, no. A sound man is sort of like an umpire in baseball. You never notice them until something bad happens. When they're doing their job, everything just flows so smoothly and they never get any credit for anything. God bless them. I'm glad I'm not one of them. So Moses is chosen by God. God has chosen his task. And he is sent by God for a specific task. Bring the Israelites out of the land. Now, here's something that we need to stop here and notice. 
because it's amazing how often this will happen for us as well. And that is, the past is overcome. You see, when God chooses you, and when God invites you, a lot of times you're going to find that there is a direct correlation to something in your past that you thought you would never get over. Now, the past in Moses' life, and it's interesting how this works so many times, Moses, when he found out that he was an Israelite and not an Egyptian, felt sympathy for his people. And on one occasion, he saw an Egyptian that was abusing and an Israelite, and Moses killed the man and hid his body and thought, I will lead an insurrection and a revolt. But he didn't keep it hidden as well as he thought. And there was a time when he saw two Israelites arguing with each other, and Moses stepped in and said, Why are you fighting with each other? And he got a question that changed his life. And the question that he got is, Who made you a leader? Who made you a leader? Moses is trying to help him, and instead of somebody saying, thank you, he's asked the question, who made you a leader? Who are you? And Moses didn't have a good answer. And that's going to be a huge difference when he goes back. Because basically he's going to be asked the same question. Who made you a leader? And his answer is going to be the Lord God of Israel. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the one who made me a leader. But his earlier escapade, he's had to live with. That's why he leaves Egypt. <clears throat> he realizes things aren't working out the way that I thought they were. And that's because the self-centered leader will always lead to chaos. <clears throat> when you're concerned with what you want, it never works out the way that you thought. I remember when I first got married, I used to carry on imaginary conversations in my head. Some of you may have done something like this. There would be some issue that I felt like my wife needed to address. And so I would imagine I will say this, and then she'll say this, and then I'll say this, and then she'll say this, and then I'll say this. And I had it all programmed out to get the result that I wanted. There was one small problem. Sheila never kept to the script. Never. Not one time. You know, after a few dozen times, I finally figured out, you know, this doesn't work. Why? Because I was approaching it totally from myself, what I wanted, what I thought, what I had experienced. And that's the problem with being self-centered. It will always lead to chaos. It never works out according to plan. It never happens. That's what happened with Moses. 
I believe God had birthed within his heart, within his soul, a desire because God knew that one day he was going to call him. And I believe that God had put that desire that the children of Israel should be free. The problem is Moses tried to do it on his own. And it ended in disaster. He's wanted by the Egyptians. His own people look at him and they don't trust him. He has to leave and go in exile. And thinks it was a dream, but it'll never happen. It's amazing as you go through it how many times people God has given them dreams and they try and fulfill it themselves and it ends up in a disaster. Some of you God has given dreams. He's given you a dream that maybe your family might be saved. He's given you a dream that maybe a friend of yours may be reached. He's given you a dream that maybe your family won't live in disharmony anymore, but they can learn how to live in harmony. And you've tried effort after effort after effort on your own. And it never works. I was talking with a lady one time and she was telling me about her family and she had gone back and she had tried to do all these things to try and rectify a situation. And I asked her a question. I said, tell me, is that the way they've always been? She said, yes. I said, then why did you expect them to change? She said, I don't know. I was just hoping. You see, a lot of times we may want to bring about change, but there are some cases that are very hard, whether it's freeing people from the land of Egypt or fixing our families, that it takes the hand of God to move in and rectify things and change things. Because we find that with all of our good intentions, with all of the things that we have, with all of our motivation, it just doesn't work. We don't have the power. We don't have the ability. We don't have what it takes. And so we have to wait. For God to move. For God to change things. The last thing to notice about this. God's choices redeems us from our past. I think Moses had a lot of time on his hand watching the sheep. I think he thought a lot about the past. I think he did a lot of, well, what if I did this? Or what if I did that? And it's amazing how many people are in bondage to their past to the things that they go and they look back on and they think, I tried. I gave it my best effort. I tried to free my people. And then God steps in. And God redeems us from our past. God redeems us not just from our sins, but from our past. The things that have burdened us, the things that we've been dragging around for years. And that's why it's so important for us to answer the invitation that God gives us. Because a lot of times, as in the case of Moses here, not only do we understand what God wants us to do, but we find that it redeems us from the things that we've been hanging on to for years. We're redeemed. We're redeemed. That's one of the most important things that you could seek for in your life 
is what is God's will? What is God's will? What is His will? When you're doing His will, it's amazing how all the other stuff will line up. It's amazing how the things that worried you no longer become a problem. Moses probably had wondered, well, I don't guess I could ever go back. They may still have those wanted posters out for me. But now, when he goes back, and they ask, who made you our leader? God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If the Egyptians come against him, they, he knows well, they're not just coming against me. The Lord God of Israel has sent me. See, when you're in his hands, when you're doing his work, you're under his protection. That's why the Apostle Paul would look at it when the Romans had arrested and they were threatening to take his life. He said, take my life? Oh, I go to be with Jesus. Let me live? I'll do the work of the Lord. Oh, that's just great. Because Paul knew. He had accepted the call of God. He had accepted the choice of God. And he knew. God's in control of things now. Not me. When I do things, it messes up. And I told you earlier about Paul, his desire to be the apostle to the Jews. And he wrote in one of his epistles, I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. Peter, he's the apostle to the Jews. God blesses Peter when he preaches to the Jews. God blesses me when I preach to the Gentiles. And he lived with that because he knew that was God's choice and not his. And when you accept God's choice in your life, you will achieve more peace than you will ever know at any time. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you we thank you, God, that you invite us to participate in your work. You invite us, Lord, to join you in the work that you would have us to do. And God, I pray that those of us who have been struggling, God, that we would accept your will, that we would sacrifice our own will, that we would sacrifice our own goals, and we would say, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And God, I pray and I ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. In his name we say, amen. As you know, we allow you to text questions in. Why did God pick this specific time to free the children of Israel after all this time in captivity? There are a lot of things that are going on when you look at it. And he starts giving indications of this 400 years earlier when he was talking to Abraham. He told Abraham, he said, I'm going to send your descendants to, is to Egypt. And then when the time is right for the Canaanites to be displaced, then I'm going to bring you back. In other words, God was working on a number of different fronts and situations and God knew exactly the right time also it was the right time for the children of Israel to wake up and to be willing to follow God and <clears throat> because even they would still struggle if you go through and you follow the story a lot of them even after they left Egypt, a lot of them still wanted to go back. And sometimes, just like with the uh, prodigal son, things have got to get so bad before you're finally willing 
to make a change. So those are all factors that are going in so God knew exactly the right time. Okay? What is God's work that I am invited to participate in? That's going to vary from individual to individual. For some of you, it's going to be, seem very simple, and that is God's invited you to participate in a godly family. God's invited you to participate in a godly community. God may give you a specific area of ministry that you want to work on. Now, I'll tell you as a pastor how I, gen how I usually recognize what God's telling you to work on because you'll come to me and you'll say, Pastor, we ought to do something or you ought to do something about X, fill in the X. Well, God's brought that to your attention and you want me to do something about it and a lot of times it's God speaking to you. So, just a thought. All right. Thank you so much. Again, remember if... Uh, you want to give to the Gideons, make your check out to the church, Cornerstone Church of God. Dan will be writing one check for them. And that offering bag is going to be back there in the center door in the back next to me. So if you want to give something to their ministry, I encourage you to do that. And that's where you can. Other places will have your regular tithes and offerings for that. But I encourage you to give to that. And, of course, we have the dinner downstairs. Everyone is invited. And we're looking forward to having a good time of fellowship this afternoon. Brother Dan.